As the U.S.-led proxy war in Ukraine continues, the U.S. and its allies, they are continuing to shape the Asian Pacific region for a conflict there, one very similar to the one being waged against Russia, but in this case, the target is China. And they're not just targeting China by interfering in Taiwan, uh, Taiwan being a territory of China, recognized as such even by the United States and its allies, uh, but at the same time, they encourage the client regime that they've installed into power in Taiwan to pursue independence. And of course, uh, this is going to create a very big problem down the road in uh, the near or to intermediate future. Uh, but what I want to talk about are the other areas of contention the United States and its allies are cultivating. So let's take a look at this article right here. U.S. and allies launch initiative to help Pacific Islands, island nations. And it says the U.S., U.K., Australia, New Zealand, and Japan have launched a fresh initiative to help Pacific Island nations in an effort to increase their presence in a maritime region that is increasingly targeted by China. Listen to the language that they're using, increasingly targeted by China. Uh, let's see what they mean by that here in just a moment. Uh, Washington and its allies created Partners in Blue Pacific on Friday after several days of talks with Pacific Island countries. The scheme aims to help small island nations such as Fiji, Palau, Samoa, and the Marshall Islands tackle issues from climate change to illegal fishing, but it also marks a stepped up effort to counter Chinese initiatives. What are these Chinese initiatives? that they're talking about. Of course, they're talking about China trying to increase trade with many of these island nations, build infrastructure for them, develop them, uh, pull them out of the poverty, the political instability that they have been suffering under for decades, uh, which, is an, which is an irony because these island nations are considered the backyard of countries like Australia and New Zealand, and also for some reason, the United States. So what is the US really talking about when they say countering China? They mean countering progress, development, peace, stability, all of these things that a nation actually needs and all of these things that these nations are increasingly turning toward China to achieve because the decades of partnership with the West has not resulted in any tangible progress. The Financial Times article also claims one U.S. official told the Financial Times it would include a range of measures, including boosting diplomatic presences across the region and helping countries tackle climate change and illegal fishing. Now, these are all different pretexts for increasing political interference and in the internal political affairs of these countries, as well as bolstering uh, a Western military presence in and around the territory of these countries. The article continues. It says, uh, this U.S. official says, the U.S. would also supply more COVID-19 vaccines to countries and added that the initiative would also include an arrangement to send young leaders from the region to executive education courses in America. Executive education. What is this? This is the U.S. taking young people that they think will eventually work their way into positions of power in uh, the media of these countries, the government of these countries, or or business, big business in these countries. And so they'll send them to the United States to be essentially indoctrinated and then sent back to their home countries where they will be networked into and of service to U.S. interests. This is how it works. This is how imperialism has worked since ancient times. Uh, and this is a topic that I'm going to get into uh, much deeper here in the near future. Uh, but suffice to say that that's what that means. When they say executive education, they mean indoctrinating these people into serving Western interests, often at the, uh, at the cost of their own nation's interests, their own personal best interests in some cases. And uh, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about and how long, this isn't a new idea. Uh, none of this is a new idea. This is just the US trying to reassert itself using the same uh, tactics and strategies that it has used to control these and influence these countries for decades uh, up until now. 
Look at this cable from WikiLeaks. Um, now, remember, WikiLeaks, uh, the founder, Julian Assange, this is the West talking about how they're going to improve life for all of these people in the Pacific region, you know, against the threat of China, who they claim tramples human rights. Um, Julian Assange is going to go to jail for the rest of his life because the United States is going to put him in jail for the rest of his life for simply exposing things like this that I'm about to show you. So let's look at this article. It's titled Program for Solomon Islands. And it is dated 1976, and it's talking about recruiting uh, up-and-coming political leaders in the Solomon Islands. This is another one of the islands the U.S. is trying to fight China over. And the, the cable says, this individual is an up-and-coming public servant with a promising career in the government ahead of him. He will have increasing influence in the government, and a knowledge of the United States would be broadening for him and of value to the U.S. government. So what they're saying is that uh, they're going to send him to the United States, indoctrinate him, send him back, and then everything that he sees, everything he says and does will be through a, a filter, a pro-American filter. And this, the U.S. has done this all around the world, but also including the Pacific Islands for decades, decades and decades. And we can see that these nations are still impoverished, uh, politically unstable. Uh, they have no prospects right now because of the way the U.S. and its allies, its Western allies, have been exploiting these countries, essentially using them to advance their own interests at the cost of these island nations. Now, getting back to this Financial Times article, uh, it also says, but the official added that there was an undeniable security component to the reinvigorated U.S. engagement with the region. There may be some security steps that we would take over time to help buttress our position in the region, he said. I imagine we're going to have more ship visits, more engagement, and there may even be something a little bit more permanent. So they're accusing China of creating security deals that'll eventually evolve into a permanent military presence, a Chinese military presence uh, across these islands. China has denied that. There's no evidence that China is actually going to do that. But here's the United States coming out and saying, yes, well, that's what we're going to do. We're, we're going to send more ships, and by that they mean warships, to the region, and there might be something more permanent, meaning a, a naval base. And uh, what they're going to try to do is through force, lock out China and anyone else that comes along that might disrupt the status quo, which is keeping these nations impoverished, destabilized, divided, and subordinated to Western interests. That's what this is all about. Uh, now, the article is trying to explain why the West is trying to reinvigorate its presence in, in the Pacific region. The move comes months after U.S., Australia, and New Zealand grew very alarmed about Beijing's rising influence in the Pacific after the leaking of a security pact between China and the Solomon Islands. The pact sparked concern that China could build a naval base in an area that is closer to Canberra and Hawaii than Beijing, giving the Chinese military much greater ability to project power in the Pacific, kind of like how U.S. military bases in Japan and South Korea are much closer to China than they are to any anything perceived as American territory. So um, it's, it's okay for the West to do this. It's not okay for China to do this, if that's even what China is doing. They say it's concern that China could do this, but they're not doing this. They didn't say they're doing this, and they've taken no steps to actually do this. This is in the imagination of the West, and it's because the West wants to maintain total control over these countries, so they create a, a pretext to do so and to take extreme measures that they otherwise couldn't uh, by inducing fear. The Solomon Islands, why, why is the Solomon Islands signing a pact with China in the first place? Well, they're doing it in the first place because of the state of economic destitution that they are suffering under, uh, the political instability created by U.S. interference in their internal political affairs. And we remember November 2021, uh, articles like this one, Solomon Islands unrest, three bodies found in burnt out buildings. The badly burnt victims were discovered in a, in a building in Chinatown in Haniara, 
after days of rioting. We remember hearing about these deadly riots in the Solomon Islands. Well, there's a, a complete backstory to all of this that the Western media was not very forthcoming in explaining. So here's what The Guardian says. The explosion of violence is partly a result of frustrations with Prime Minister Manasseh Sogavari's government and chronic unemployment made worse by the pandemic. Experts say that the crisis has also been fueled by long-standing animosity between residents of the most populous island, Malaita, and the central government based on the island of Guadalcanal. Uh, it's a series of islands, the so Solomon Islands. Uh, so there's tensions between the populations of the two most populous islands. The archipelago nation of around 700,000 people has for decades endured ethnic and political tensions. And remember, this is an island, along, uh, an island nation with, along with many other island nations in the Pacific region, they are all suffering from similar problems. Their partnerships and relationship uh, to the West, Western nations, the US, Australia, New Zealand, even the UK and France for some reason, uh, again, a holdover of white Western imperialism that, that stretched for generations, uh, exploited and uh, subordinated these nations for generations. Uh, they're still suffering from the fallout of that. The West has done absolutely nothing to rectify any of it. Um, so that was what the Guardian initially claims was behind these protests, but that's not true. And the Guardian eventually admits the real reason why we saw that flare up of violence at the end of 2021. Malaita residents have long complained that their island is neglected by the central government and divisions intensified when Sogavari recognized Beijing in 2019. That's what it was actually about. It was about uh, a US backed opposition uh, group on this other island and that they were going to use to try to punish or reverse the decision by the central government to no longer recognize Taiwan as an independent country, something the US doesn't even do, and instead to recognize Beijing and the People's Republic of China and finally fix their relationship with China so that they can take advantage of all of the opportunities that there are when working with the People's Republic of China. And this is not something that I'm imagining or that the Chinese media is imagining. This is something that the Western media had even pointed out over the last couple of years. So and I'm going to get into that in just a moment, but I want to show you this article. News from China's security pact with Solomon Islands generates suspicion, offense, and backtrack. And the article says the agreement between Beijing and Haniara is intended to respond to the Solomon Islands soft and hard domestic threats, with the Solomons continuing to roll out its national security strategy and uphold its friends to all and enemies to none foreign policy, according to Haniara. That's the government uh, of the Solomon Islands. This is why they say they are doing this pact with China, because they're saying there are threats that need to be addressed. And I suppose that their current relationship with the West is not able to address it. As a matter of fact, it's actually the source of these threats. Uh, the article goes on and says, this is the South China Morning Post. They also say, Prime Minister Scott Morrison, so this, this was a, an older article, uh, said, there is great concern across the Pacific family because we are in constant contact with our Pacific family, according to Sky News. New Zealand used a similar tone when it said on Monday the country was gravely concerned about possible militarization of the Pacific following a decision by the Solomon Islands government to form a security partnership with China. Yet, uh, this wouldn't even have been necessary if the West was actually helping the Solomon Islands rather than dividing and destroying them, keeping them subordinated and using them as a, a weapon, as a battering ram against China and anyone else in the region that the West wants to un un unleash them on. Uh, because remember, that violence targeted Chinatown specifically. Chinese citizens, Chinese businesses, they were specifically targeted in this attack. Now, there's evidence from the Western media itself that that unrest was indeed sponsored by the U.S., encouraged by the U.S. government. Let's take a look at this article here, The Diplomat. USAID pledge to pro-Taiwan Solomon Islands province raises eyebrows. So it's not to the pro-Taiwan Solomon Islands, period. It's pro-Taiwan Solomon Islands province, Malaita, 
that's where this money went. This, this article is from 2020. And it says, the United States has pledged $25 million in aid to the Solomon Islands province of Malaita. And they circumvented the central government by, by doing so, by the way. Uh, which has in recent weeks made calls for succession from the national government over its relationship with China. So when the Solomon Islands central government changed its relationship with China, no longer recognized the Republic of China seated in Taipei and instead the People's Republic of China in Beijing, the, the people running Malaita, this province of the Solomon Islands, they said, well, we're going to become independent. We're going to succeed from the Solomon Islands. We'll make our own pro-Taiwan country, which when you really think about it, does not serve anyone's interests at all, except for a small handful of people at the top of the government receiving tens of millions of dollars from the US government. Now let's continue with the, the diplomat, a pro-Western publication, Malaita, the largest province in the Solomon Islands, announced its plan to hold a referendum on independence last month, citing the central government's switch in diplomatic relations with Taiwan to China last year. The decision has put Malaita at odds with the rest of the country, as Malaita preferred to continue relations with Taiwan because they're being paid off by the U.S. government and also the administration of Taiwan. Millions and millions of dollars, they get paid to maintain this irrational diplomatic stance that benefits absolutely absolutely no one in the short, intermediate, or long term. Uh, no one in the Solomon Islands benefits from this irrational diplomatic stance recognizing Taiwan when not even the United States does. The United States recognizes the one China policy. They don't, they don't honor it, they don't uphold it, but they officially recognize it. Now, before I get into uh, this further, I just want to show you what the Prime Minister of the Solomon Islands said himself uh, to Chinese media about uh, the government's decision to recognize the People's Republic of China and to fix this ridiculous stance where they were one of the only countries on earth uh, recognizing Taiwan as an uh, independent country. Let's listen to this. Say it is a very, very important decision. It uh, took us 36 years to make. And as member of the United Nations, we are duty bound to acknowledge and recognize Resolution 2758 of 1971. China is a growing, powerful economy. One day, it will overtake the United States as the biggest economy. That's a fact, a reality, that every nation of the world need to appreciate, and especially developing countries that are aspiring to, to move forward in development. You cannot, you cannot disregard the important position, economic position, that uh, the People's Republic of China uh, has in the, in, in the global, global world. So those are some of the reasons. And we made the decisions. We, we believe it is it's the right decision, it's the correct decision to make, and uh, we're just moving forward, seeing that China is a very, very important uh, economic power in the world, and all sensible leaders in the world must acknowledge the existence of, uh, of, of China and relate to it in a meaningful way like we do now. So as you can see, uh, listening to the prime minister himself, uh, it makes perfect sense. Uh, China is going to be the largest economy on earth, it is, an, is a huge country, uh, an important country, the most populous country on earth. Why would you take a diplomatic stance that would make an enemy out of them and a diplomatic stance that no one else on earth has except for a couple of other very small countries that the U.S. has paid off to take this stance. Why would you do that to yourself? It makes no sense. So this is obviously in the best interest of the Solomon Islands, except for the fact that the U.S. is going to punish the Solomon Islands for making a decision that suits their own interests rather than Washington's, uh, punish or reverse the decision. That is what the U.S. is going to try and do. Now, let's get back to this diplomat article. The US aid package, more than 50 times what the province received in aid from all countries in 2018, has sparked concerns that Washington is using the aid for geopolitical gain to counter China, despite the risks it poses in flaring old tensions. And, and they explain what they're talking about. The Solomon Islands endured five years of civil war between 1998 and 2003, as the country was split along ethnic, cultural, and political lines between Malaita 
the second largest and most populous province and Guadalcanal, where the capital is and the central government is located. The largest by area and the second by population and home to the central government in the capital of Haniara. So this is what the U.S. does everywhere. They fuel political and social division to divide and weaken a country so that they're able to better coerce the country, to get them to reverse decisions that they've made to suit their own best interests and instead uh, adopt a, a policy that serves Washington's interests, often at the cost of that country. The Solomon Islands' lack of development, its uh, impoverished economy, this is all due to the fact that they have subordinated themselves to the West, who does not care about developing them and instead is using them as a political battering ram against China. And uh, this is something that not only the United States is doing to the Solomon Islands and, and other s small, vulnerable countries, Taiwan is also doing this. The administration in Taiwan that is pursuing you know, a track toward independence, uh, violating the territorial integrity of China, uh, they are also doing this. So this is another diplomat article. Taiwan must avoid pouring fuel on Solomon Island's fire. Again, this is a pro-Western publication. The Diplomat is not pro-China by any stretch of the imagination. And it says, in June 2001, a US $25 million loan to Solomon Islands from Taiwan's Export-Import Bank was announced by Taipei. The suitably vaguely stated purpose was to foster peace by compensating the victims of the ethnic conflict that had ravaged the island since 1998. That is what the other diplomat article was talking about. But while some of the money went to legitimate causes, displaced families and unpaid civil servants, the lion's share ended up lining the pockets of politicians and militia leaders. Armed gangs held a government ministers for compensation as Haniara descended into mob rule. So the money is basically funding pro-Taiwan, pro-US opposition groups, agitators, uh, militias to create chaos in the Solomon Islands, to punish them for any attempt to actually pursue their own interests. The article also says, although it is unclear what role the China-Taiwan dynamic played in last week's unrest, they're talking about 2021, Beijing's successful 2019 bid to lure Haniara from Taipei's ever dwindling fold of diplomatic allies has been widely cited as a factor. And again, it only made sense for the Solomon Islands to recognize Beijing over Taipei. It makes absolutely no sense to recognize Taipei as not a country. No one considers it a country. Even the United States, the UK, the EU, none of them recognize Taiwan as a country. They don't have embassies in Taiwan. Taiwan has no embassies in each one of these Western countries. And, and what, But what they do is they coerce these smaller nations to take this irrational stance at their own cost so that at least it looks like they can, you know, they can say, oh, well, some countries do actually recognize Taiwan as a country. And, you know, it's a building block that they could build on later if the geopolitical climate changes. That, that's what that's all about. It's about making the Solomon Islands and other small nations coerce into recognizing Taiwan, pay the price for this irrational diplomatic stance that, that will cost them ties with China. Now, there's also articles like this. Um, U.S., this is from ABC Australia, the U.S. denies geopolitical motives are behind a massive aid increase to the Solomon Islands, M Malatai province. That's what they're saying. They're saying, well, we didn't, we're not paying them off to adopt this pro-U.S. stance. That makes absolutely no sense for the people actually living in the Solomon Islands. Uh, it's aid. It's, it's aid uh, assistance. That's what that is. But when you're pumping tens of millions of dollars into a country like the Solomon Islands, a very small country with 700,000 people total in population, and you don't see any actual development taking place, but what you do see is a, a well-funded, well-organized, highly motivated opposition group that is willing to spill blood, you know, attack and destroy the capital, attack Chinese interests there at the Solomon Islands, it's very obvious that that is where the money is going. It surely isn't going toward development. No development is taking place. This is why the Solomon Islands wants to pivot toward China. Now, I 
I showed you the Prime Minister of the Solomon Islands explaining why his government wanted to, to change this and pivot back towards China. Uh, I also will show you articles like this, uh, also from ABC, Australian media. Solomon Islands joins China's Belt and Road Initiative as leaders meet in Beijing. And every, every developing country is doing this. They're joining the Belt and Road Initiative. They're already benefiting from positive ties with China in terms of trade. Uh, China is a huge export market. It's the top export partner for most countries now. And this article says Solomon Islands Prime Minister Manase Sogavari has met Chinese President Xi Jinping in the Pacific leader's first official visit to China since his government controversially cut diplomatic ties with Taiwan. There's no controversy at all. It is the only decision that actually made sense. It is one of the few decisions that the government has, has made you know, across the last few decades that actually serves the Solomon Islands interests instead of Washington's interests at the cost of their own interests. The, the beginning of this deal would be China investing in infrastructure in the Solomon Islands to create a, a, a pipeline for Chinese tourists to come through the country. Uh, and Ch Chinese tourism, you know, when, once it gets back to normal, I mean, it has a huge impact on the economies of different countries. Now, I'm based in Thailand. Thailand is perceived as, you know, being a tourist based economy, but it is not. It's a manufacturing and agricultural based economy. It's an it's a recently industrialized country. Uh, but Chinese tourism uh, boosted the percentage of GDP that that uh, tourism makes up for Thailand. So it went from being a little bit above average to average in terms of, you know, tourism as part of a GDP globally uh, to being way, way over the average. And that was primarily because of Chinese tourism. I mean, it was a it was a huge boost to uh, the economy. And then it was a huge hit to the economy when, when COVID came around. And people are still waiting for that to kind of turn around. Uh, but it will have a huge impact for the Solomon Islands. It's a tiny country with few resources. This is something that they can get started on and start making money that they otherwise would not be making. A, a tourist-based economy is not something you want to focus on entirely and permanently, but it is something that could start something else. So that, that is what China is proposing. It's more than anything the West has been proposing to the Solomon Islands, uh, who have influenced the, the Solomon Islands all of these years up until now. So we'll, we'll have to wait and see. But as you can tell, the US is trying to prevent that. They said they're going to counter Chinese-led initiatives. Well, helping the Solomon Islands build up infrastructure to accept tourists and to make money, they're going to counter that. That's what they said. They said they're going to counter Chinese-led initiatives. This is one of their initiatives. So it's, it's obvious that for the Solomon Islands, recognizing Beijing, the People's Republic of China, uh, getting rid of this irrational stance that even the US doesn't have regarding Taiwan as an independent country, that was in the Solomon Islands' best interests. It costs the US its own interest. And this is why the US is, you know, targeting the Solomon Islands and also these other Pacific islands to punish them, to reverse their, their decisions, their attempt to develop their own independent foreign policy that serves their own interests. They're going to punish them. They're going to try to reverse it. You saw in the, the first article, the Financial Times, they're saying they're um, reinvigorating their, you know, their, their involvement in these countries. And as you can see, it has always been exploitative. One other thing, if you look into this partnership in Blue Pacific, they will talk about the United States, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, which the United States not so much, but the other three kind of make sense because they're kind of in the same region. Uh, but what about France and the UK? Why are they involved? Uh, France has not made a commitment, but they have been invited to join this partnership in Blue Pacific. But the UK is involved already. Why? What is this? And as I've mentioned many times before, it is the continuation of racist white imperialism generations of it, it is continuing into modern times, the year 2022. And uh, instead of, you know, the white man's burden and being open about how they really feel about this and how they 
they feel about the the population, the rest of the world, and how uh, inferior they are, and how it's the West's right to to conquer all of this territory that these inferior people aren't aren't using, const you know, constructively anyway. This is a continuation of it, and they do it all under the guise of you know, development, democracy promotion, human rights. Again, uh, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, who ex you know, exposed many things, including the US program to indoctrinate up and coming leaders of the Solomon Islands. Julian Assange is facing the, re uh, the, his, the rest of his life in prison uh, from this country that claims it's out there crusading for human rights. It's just something to keep in mind uh, to pierce through the immense amount of hypocrisy and the smoke screen that the U.S. puts up when what it's really doing is just pursuing, continuing, really, this racist imperialism that the West has been engaged in for generations. One last thing I want to take a look at uh, for you to consider uh, is this. This is the Atlas of Economic Complexity, Harvard University. I'm going to show you another one uh, from MIT. And this is 2019, the Solomon Islands. Where did they import from? You can see China is a huge import partner. What about exports? And, and uh, Australia over here, they're number two. The United States, France, you know, they like to sell stuff to the Solomon Islands, but let's see when it comes to buying things from the Solomon Islands. China is by far the largest export market for the Solomon Islands. China is, you know, and it's a trade surplus for the Solomon Islands. Where's, where's Australia? Where's New Zealand? Where's the United States? You almost can't even see them here. It's China. China is China is the Solomon Islands' most important trade partner, and it is a trade partner that is providing a trade surplus for the Solomon Islands when all of these Western nations are, are not. And sometimes it just works out that way, but when you look at the whole history of the West and how it deals with these nations, the fact that they have had influence over these countries for decades and the impoverished destabilized state that they exist in today it's is not that hard to you know connect it and see that they're selling they're dumping goods on the solomon islands they're not doing anything to help develop an export market for the solomon islands so that they can crawl out of the the hole the economic destitution that they have been stuck in china is actually the one helping them out so when the Chinese foreign minister goes to these other Pacific islands and shows them what they're going to do for the Solomon Islands. It's not a hard decision for them to say, yes, let's try something new for decades. We've been impoverished. There's political division, instability. We have no prospects when we work with the West. Yes, maybe we'll give it a try. It can't, can't hurt to try. And countries that will say, no, we're not working with China it's because of the unwarranted influence the U.S. and its allies hold o over those countries. If we could take a look at, um, well, this is, that was 2019. This is Solomon Islands. This is the MIT uh, Atlas of Economic Complexity. And you can see it's the same story for imports, exports. It's the same, it's the same story. Uh, so that's something that doesn't change year to year. What is the West talking about doing? They're talking about just reinvesting in all of these things that they have been doing for decades in the first place to maintain control over these islands. They're not offering anything new. They're not offering any, any prospects for these countries. They're just going to block them from taking advantage of prospects offered by China. That's what they're doing. That is what they're doing here in Southeast Asia. They're not offering a, an alternative for the high-speed rail network China's trying to build here. They're just trying to cancel it. That's all they're going to do. And they're going to leave countries like in the Pacific region or here in Southeast Asia. They're just going to leave them isolated, uh, uh, put people into power who are going to irrationally be belligerent toward China. It's going to hurt their economy. It's going to unravel their society. And the only interests being served are those in Washington and their long-standing, decades-long containment policy vis-a-vis -vis China. So I hope that kind of helps explain what's going on uh, with these Pacific Island countries. It's a microcosm of what is going on all around the globe. The U.S. countering China. What is China doing? They're helping boost development and economic trade, peace and stability. So if the U.S. is countering that, what they're trying to do is the opposite. They're trying to impoverish countries, 
isolate them, divide and destroy their societies, uh, create stagnation in terms of infrastructure, investments. That's what the U.S. is doing. They have had almost uncontested influence over all of these countries, Southeast Asia, the Pacific Island nations, uh, you know, uh, South America, Central America, many countries in Africa, they've had uh, almost uncontested influence over them for decades. And they're, they're all suffering from the same problems. They're all turning to China because they know that there's no prospects working with the US. The US is a unipolar hegemon Oh, the way a hegemon maintains power is by keeping everyone else down. China is not doing that. Their Belt and Road Initiative is explicitly countering that entire notion of, of a hegemon in the making. They are building up these other nations economically, politically, even militarily, so that if sometime in the future China has a, a change in leadership and they're tempted to pursue hegemony, they're not going to be able to because they've helped build all of these nations up. The West, as a rule, all throughout its history, has beaten nations down to keep them from becoming competitors. Uh, China is not afraid of competition. They're also not afraid of cooperation. That is the foundation they're building this new multipolar world order that they're investing in, along with Russia and many others. That's what they're doing. And this is how the US plans on countering it, by pumping money into Malaita in the Solomon Islands to boost up a, a violent, angry mob that will just keep burning everything down across the Solomon Islands. That's their solution. That's their counter to China coming in, offering peace, stability through security and investment and trade. That's their. That's what the U.S. is countering them with. So I hope that kind of sheds some light on this, uh, makes it a little bit more clear. You're not going to hear a lot of people get into the details of what's going on into the, you know, the Pacific Islands. They're very small countries, uh, very, very easy to overlook what's going on, especially with the situation in Ukraine unfolding, the, the focus on Taiwan right now. Uh, but I, I hope that helps clear things up. We'll keep an eye on this. And uh, if there's any other developments, major developments, we'll talk about it. And now you have a background uh, understanding of what's happening. So when there's new developments, you'll see very clearly what it is because the Western media won't, won't make it clear. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing. It's free to do. It helps the channel grow. Uh, hit the notification bell so that you get updates when I upload a new video. Check the video description below, especially if you're watching this on YouTube so you can find and follow my work on other platforms like Telegram, which I update regularly, and uh, Odyssey and Rumble, everything is backed up there so that if I get deleted off of YouTube, you can still find and follow my, my videos. Uh, Telegram is a replacement for Facebook and Twitter, which I have been kicked off of, suspended from permanently because of my coverage of things like the crisis in Ukraine. Also in the video description below, you will find all of the links that I just referenced. There are a lot of them for this video. Please look through them. You will see how it's, it's the Western media telling you this. It's not Chinese state media. Uh, it is the Western media admitting that this is the game the U.S. is playing in the Pacific region. Also in the video description are ways you can help support my work. You can do that through Buy Me A Coffee and through Patreon. I also have PayPal, but uh, PayPal is very un unreliable, so please only use that as a last resort if you can't use any other option. Uh, to everyone who has been helping out Thank you so much, whether it's a one-time donation, a month-to-month -month support, or even if you're just helping support me by sharing my work with others. I greatly appreciate all of that. I could not do this work without that support, so thank you. And as always, thank you for watching.